Good morning, church. Why don't we sing as we worship? Sing to our King. I give you glory for all you've brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to find. everyone. My name is Emily Mitchell. I'm one of the student ministers here at Christ Church. We are honored to be together this morning and worship. And uh, we do want to let you know if you're new around here or if you've been visiting and, and have not yet met us, we would love for you to go out into the lobby and meet us at the Welcome Center. We do have a small gift that you can use at our cafe if um, if that's your first time going, going to the Welcome Center. We also have something called the Next Step Coffee that we do around here. And this is for people who are new here, but also for people who are maybe looking for um, a new way to get involved with our church. And so if you're interested in that or have questions kind of of how to get involved, we would love for you to join us August 14th at 1045 for the Next Step Coffee. And if you have questions, you can contact Crystal or go to the link on the screen. Um, also, we uh, want to remind you that Global Leadership Summit, which you've been hearing about for the last couple of weeks, is still available to be signed up for. So if you uh, or someone you know would be interested, we all have scopes of influence that we um, are a part of. And so if you're wanting to know how to best, um, you know, use those, those moments and those, uh, that influence, Global Leadership Summit is for you and you can sign up at the link. Uh, I also get the opportunity today to introduce you to somebody from Mustard Seed that we really love around here. His name's Sam Martin. If you guys would give him a round of applause. <laughs> good morning, Christchurch Boronogo. <laughs> good to be back. Yeah, it's good to be back. Good to be back. Especially um, third service. Yeah, you know? our favorite service. Don't tell the others. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sam was my first co-worker here at Christ Church. I mean, I got all the co-workers at the exact same time, but, but you know. You were my favorite. <laughs> first co-worker. Um, I, when I started here in fifth year, eighth grade ministry, Sam um, had been here doing that. And so I got to learn from him and, and um, get to watch him even prepare to go to Japan. So it's That's cool right. uh, to see now the church is planted and, and work's being done. Yep. Um, but for those of you who were not co-workers with Sam, um, we're going to ask some questions for, for you to get to know him uh, and for us to just kind of, you know, Remember why we love him. So I've got a lot of questions and I'm going to read them quickly. Okay, okay? I'll, I'll do my best. Here we go. Spotify or Apple Music? Spotify. Do you have your wisdom teeth? No, they're gone. <laughs> I don't know where they are. <laughs> 
Wait, did you ever have them? Yeah, I had them. Oh, okay. There, but I got them taken out. Yeah, okay, okay, cool. Uh, first car you drove? Uh, S10 Chevy pickup truck. Anybody else? From Oklahoma, so. <laughs> that makes yeah. sense, yeah. It's the Oklahoma car. Um, when did you decide to follow Jesus? When I was eight years old. Eight years old. Mm -hmm. um, would you rather be able to jump really high or run really fast? Run really fast. What is something exciting that you want to tell everyone? Most exciting thing right now for my family and I is when we get back to Japan on August 18th, we have finished all the process, all the paperwork, the home study and everything so that we are now able to adopt in Japan. So we awesome. are excited to get back to hopefully meet a new little Martin. So <laughs> Japanese right. Martin. Yeah. That's very exciting. You can cheer. That's great. <laughs> yeah. um, favorite Pokemon? Uh, Arcanine. Does that mean anything to anybody? It's a fire, like dog type okay. of Pokemon. <laughs> sure. I have to believe you. <laughs> Favorite food in Japan? Sushi. Uh, dodgeball strategy? Uh, be very careful. <laughs> um, favorite emoji? <laughs> I don't know. I don't really do emojis. I just did a face. Okay. Uh, music, audiobook, podcast. Which one? Podcast. Who is the best at Japanese in your family? Rosie, who's my seven-year-old daughter. <laughs> She's very good. Humbles, humbles you. Yeah, it's sad <laughs> for me. Um, home phone number growing up. Oh, 743-3372. 405 for those in Oklahoma from Love Oklahoma. It. So. Okay, everyone else do yours right now. I'm just kidding. Okay, um, Starbucks order. Uh, tall black coffee. Notebook or the holiday? Neither, Lord of the Rings. Okay. <laughs> uh, fingers for legs or legs for fingers? What? Answer. <laughs> fingers. <laughs> I don't even know which one you... Legs. Okay. <laughs> um, last question. What led you and your family into ministry and specifically to Japan for ministry? So my wife uh, grew up here at Christ Church of Arnogo since she was a little girl. And I got the chance to, when I moved to Joplin, Missouri to go to school, I came to Christ Church of Arnogo and then we met and got married. And as Rachel and I were beginning to discuss what we wanted to do with our lives, uh, God just started to put on our hearts uh, this idea to go overseas and proclaim Jesus to those who'd never heard him yet. Um, we weren't sure exactly where we wanted to go, um, but God just kept putting um, international people into our lives, um, both as friends and then also as people who lived in our home for, for years, which has just been uh, a fantastic experience, both for us and for our kids. And since we were here at Christ Church of Arnogo, uh, we started to... Uh, uh, learn more about the missionaries um, that Christ Church has been supporting for a long time. And one of those were the mustard seed missionaries. Um, and some of those are people who grew up in this church. You guys have got a chance to meet some of the Greers the past uh, month. And Rachel and I had been supporting Ethan and Audrey Greer for years. And so we've been praying for them and uh, learning more about Japan and what God has been doing and the huge need that the Japanese people have. 99% um, of people do not know uh, Jesus and most of those people don't have access to a church. And so the door was just wide open for that, for that mission field and it just made sense for us to go there instead of trying to do something somewhere else. And so that's what led us there. And then for us in uh, Japan right now, we live in a city called Sendai, Japan. And we started a church there one year ago, a city metro area of 2 million people. And it's been going really, really great. It's been cool to see the stories already coming out of, of the church and hear, uh, you know, the need for a church there who some people are traveling like an hour and a half away to come to a, a place that is preaching the word of God on a, on a weekly basis and who's trying to welcome people into a community, trying to be hospital, hospitable. Um, and we're just diving into the culture and uh, the people there um, through a variety of different ways, you know, whether that's helping people in a food bank or we do this uh, partner with an organization called Art Inclusion where we help people with disabilities uh, sell um, their artwork uh, to people coming into Japan. So I get to teach English to them on a weekly basis to help uh, sell to people like me <laughs> who's <laughs> learning Japanese. Um, but Which has just been really cool. Your kids, they already know. Japanese. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, yeah they're good. good. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, I will say too, just um, as I got to know you and your wife and your family, one of the first things I noticed was your hospitality. Um, there was always somebody in your house that <laughs> yeah. was not a part of your immediate family. And I'm just really grateful that the people of Japan are experiencing the hospitality of Jesus through you guys. So what if somebody in this room wants to know more um, about you and your family mm. and your work specifically or Mustard Seed as a whole, what are some ways they could, they could do that? 
Uh, yeah, so first off, we're going to be in the lobby after this service uh, for a while, and so you're more than welcome to come up and say hi, introduce yourself, and if you want to get to know a little bit more about what we're doing in Japan, please just ask us questions. And we're also going to be at King Jack Park today um, from 2 to 4, and it's a come and go, meet and greet, you can bring your kids, there's a splash pad in a park. Um, you guys are more than welcome to come and say hi and get to know us a little bit more. Uh, and then also, if you want to know more just about Mustard Seed, you can go to our, our website, mustardseed.network, and learn more about uh, what we're doing there um, and what God has been doing there for, uh, I think it's you know, almost 13 years, 14 years, something like that. And so uh, please check that out. And if you want to get connected to me, just ask Emily or one of the other ministers on staff, and I'd love to, love to chat. Awesome. Well, would you guys please give it up for Sam one more time? Thank, Thank you, you guys so here. much. We appreciate it. Uh, before we worship together this morning, we are going to uh, do something that we've been doing a little bit more often around here, and we're going to give you a chance to meet uh, somebody in the audience right now that you don't know. So um, ask, meet somebody that you don't know, ask maybe a question that I asked to Sam, get to know them, because we really do want this community of people who are worshiping together to be more like a family than anything. And so get to know somebody, ask them a question about themselves, and then we will continue and worship together.
I'd like to read from Romans chapter 3, starting verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So as you can see, we need a savior. We need someone to save us from our sins. And thankfully, we have a God, a creator, who we rebelled against in our sin, who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross as a punishment, as a, se- or a substitute for our punishment that we deserved. And Jesus satisfied the wrath of God on that cross. And he defeated sin and death once and for all through his resurrection. So now we are going to worship God by taking communion together. And com- communion is a time where we get to remember what Jesus did on the cross. So every time we take uh, communion, we get to remember how amazing our God is. That he would love us so much that he would lay down his life for us. And I love communion because it connects us. Connects all Christians all around the world. Because all of us are taking communion to remember what Jesus did. And Jesus gave us these two symbols. uh, These two symbols uh, that represent something very, very important. And so when he had his first communion with his disciples, he took the bread. He said, this is my body. And then he took the cup of grape and he said, this is my blood that I will shed out for you, for your sins. And so every time we come together on Sunday mornings, we take these two symbols to remind us of who Jesus is and how amazing he is and how much love he has for us. So we're going to pass the trays here in just a moment. And if you are a baptized believer of Jesus Christ, please uh, grab that and remember how amazing our God is. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus, take this time uh, to think about how amazing it is that there is a God who loves you so much that he would take your punishment that we deserve because of our sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness. And Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who came down to this earth and took on the death that we deserved. Lord, we are so grateful that we have a God who loves us that much. This morning, Lord, as we gather, help us to always remember that you are God who loves. You are God who cares. We thank you for your son, Jesus, in his name. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's word. Whether you're checking us out for the first time or coming back for our online weekly gathering, our hope is that you have an experience with Jesus that makes you long for more. The truth is our lives were made for him. And we believe that we can experience the fullness of the life he offers by participating in the life of the church, which isn't a building to occupy or a screen to observe, but the community of people who call Jesus King. So we'd love to invite you to come to our in-person gatherings, which we have Thursdays at 645 and Sundays at 8, 9, 15, and 1045. We know that not everyone's circumstances allow them to gather in person, but we believe that experiencing Jesus can't be complete if it's only contained to an hour of an online service. And we want more than that for you. We want you to join a community of Jesus followers and consume the word of God, the bread and the cup of the Lord's table, the encouragement found as we worship him, but to also give that you would be a blessing by singing, listening, sacrificing, and being an encouragement to others who need your life and testimony to remind them of the greatness of our God. If you have any more questions about Christ Church, we're here for you. We'd love to connect and together experience completeness in Jesus.
here in just a few mem or just in just a few moments, we are going to worship God uh, through taking offering. An offering is a way that we get to worship God and honor Him and love other people um, and show them love throughout this community and also around the world. And one of the ways that Christ Church uses that money that is taken up in this offering is by helping plant churches on the other side of the world. And we also get to use that money to show God, or God's love to other people on the other side of the world. And one of the organizations that we partner with here at Christ Church is with Mustard Seed Network, who I get to be a part of and who I get to work with. And Mustard Seed Network is trying to uh, plant gospel-centered churches in urban Japan where people have never had the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And we're trying to plant gospel-centered churches who are trying to uh, show the love of Jesus in those communities. We're trying to bless the people of those communities, just like this church has done for my family and to countless families before us and after us. And we are thankful at, in Sendai, Japan, in our church plant there, uh, for people in Orinoco, Missouri, who have given uh, their prayers, their finances, their support to us so that we can do that. And so thank you so much on behalf of Mushy Network and our church community uh, for your guys' uh, generosity. Uh, so we got to America just a couple of weeks ago, and we were able to go to a church in Stillwater, Oklahoma. That's uh, where we first got to go to church, and then we've been here uh, today. And at Sunnybrook, I, I leaned over to my wife and I said, Rachel, there are a bunch of people here, hair, or here with gray hair on their heads. This is crazy. This is not something that we see regularly in our church. And it was like something that just hit me in a way that I was not expecting. Because people, it showed that God has been faithful, faithful, so faithful throughout generations and people are growing up in the church and they are teaching their children and their children's children about who God is. And so when I got a chance to see uh, some of my friends who I knew as a little kid and now they have gray hair upon their head, it was a reminder to me that they are being faithful to a God who is faithful to them. And I can't wait to see the day that our church in Sendai, Japan is filled with people with gray hair because that is a testament to God's faithfulness. And so I want to I say thank you to everyone who has gone before me and before us uh, here at Christ Church and before those in Sendai, Japan. Uh, I'm thankful for your faithfulness to your father and it's because of his love for you. And I, I just want to say thank you so much. So let's pray for offering this morning. Dear God, I thank you so much for your love, for your goodness, for your grace. I thank you for the people of this church, uh, for their generosity, for their prayers, their support. But Lord, I want to say thank you so much for your faithfulness. Your faithfulness who has gone before us for generations from the beginning of mankind. And I thank you uh, so much for people who have gone before me, who have been planting churches, who have been spreading the gospel, uh, who have been uh, proclaiming your name to their children and their children's children. And I pray that this continues to be a thing that we do as Christians. We love you. And this is your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Peter Buckland. I'm one of the elders here at the church and I have the privilege to bring you this morning's message. If you are visiting with us, you are joining us in the middle of a sermon series on discipleship. And we call this series Pathways. Pathways helps you to know God better, to grow in your faith and to be able to leave this place and go out into the world to live out your faith in your family and in your community. And if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, you remember that we've had two sermons on the importance of scripture. The scripture grounds us, tells us the truth, lets us know about ourselves, tells us the truth about the gospel, allows for us to see how God would like for us to live our lives. Today, we're going to be adding prayer to that. And in a couple of weeks, we're gonna be talking about community. And what I'd like to remind you of is it takes all three of those that will help for you to grow in your faith. You need to be grounded in the truth, you need to be interactive with God, and you need to be in a faith community that helps you with modeling and understanding who you are and getting the encouragement that you need in order to grow in your own faith. We all recognize that prayer could be difficult for us, which is the topic that we have for today. If we were to all raise our hands and say, oh yeah, I remember when pray, prayer was like drinking sand, we could all probably say yes, that just didn't feel very good. I didn't think anything really happened as a result of my 
interaction with God. And believe it or not, our anchor verse actually encourages us to continue praying because Paul recognizes that prayer could be difficult for us. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, which is the verse that I want you to really uh, think about this morning in your own prayer life, Paul says this, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. The word devote means to keep trying even though it's really, really difficult. So you've seen devoted athletes, devoted scholars, devoted businessmen and women. You know that they get up and they just have to get going even if it's difficult for them to do that. And Paul says, I want you to think about prayer like that. Don't think that it's really, really easy. Think about it as working through your own relationship with God so that you can get where you would like to go in intimacy with him. And then he says that you should be watchful in prayer. When you're watchful, you're seeing the handprints of God on your own life. You're seeing what God is doing in your life and what God is doing in the lives of those around you, as well as what's happening within our communities. Because we're going to be talking about bringing our prayer requests to God, and you want to bring requests to God that reflect the needs of our community, our state, our nation, and our world. And the last thing that Paul says that he wants for us to be paying particular attention to is to be thankful, to be grateful, to be able to look at our lives and say, Lord, I am so appreciative of you being in my life. And I am so grateful that you are a part of my life, helping me to become the person that you want me to be. So I was asking myself, well, why would prayer be so important? And why is prayer so difficult for us? So first of all, why is prayer so important? Well, prayer is your relational connection with God. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all relational, and so are you. You know the power of an encouraging word. You know the power of an appropriate hug. You even know the power of silence when somebody is with you. You know the power of somebody who cares about you and really knows you. That prayer is that connection that allows for you to take the word of God and what you know about God and personalize that in your own life with your own story. Well, we also know that prayer is difficult for us and we're gonna be unpacking that in a little bit about ways that you could actually use a guide that could help you to pray in ways that connect you with God. Timothy Keller is one of our favorite theologians around here, and he has two statements about prayer. The first one really reflects where we are in this study. He said, prayer is continuing a conversation that God has started through his word and his grace, which eventually becomes a full encounter with him. What we are hoping as a community, that as we interact with the Lord along the lines of the word, as we have our worship time, as we interact as a community, that we have a deeper, richer, fuller encounter with God. And it starts with us learning what that is like and grows over time. Timothy Keller then says this about prayer. Prayer is the only entryway into genuine self-knowledge. It is also the main way we experience deep change, the reordering of our loves. Prayer is how God gives us so many of the unimaginable things he has for us. Indeed, prayer makes it safe for God to give us many of the things we most desire. It is the way that we know God, the way we finally treat God as God. Prayer is simply the key to everything we need to do and be in life. We're going to set on this statement that prayer is the main way that we experience deep change. That's quite a statement, isn't it? This is why prayer is so hard. It's because we have to face ourselves and we have to interact with God and we have to grow and develop in ways that only prayer helps us to do. We all want to see God working in our lives. But what is so amazing is that God has opened his heart up to you and it is through prayer that you're able to connect with him. And I want you to think of God standing in front of you, kind of with his arms open wide, saying, I want you to come and I want you to interact with me. I want you to talk with me. I want you to sit with me. I want you to be with me. But prayer can be kind of difficult for us. And so having a predetermined way to pray could be really helpful for many of us. So the rest of this message will follow along an acronym PRAY, P-R-A-Y, to make it pretty simple for us. P stands for praise, R stands for repent, A stands for ask, and Y stands for yield. 
And we're going to put all of these together to see how in using these four different styles of prayer, we could be connected to God. So let's take a look at the first letter, praise. This helps to prepare our heart for change. To praise God means to speak of the excellence of who he is and what he has done for us. Praise is the beginning of worship, and you have spent time praising God through song. We can praise God with our words. We can praise God by singing. We can praise God with our thoughts. We can actually praise God by just sitting with kind of a grateful heart, which you may have done at one time or another, that connects you with God. Psalm 9 tells us what prayer is in two verses. The psalmist wrote this in verses 1 and 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name. So how does praise help us with transformational deep change in our lives? Well, praise and its accompanying thankfulness and gratefulness and adoration are the first steps of worship. And as we begin to move in, into our relationship with God and remind ourselves of how amazing he is, you can remember some of the ways that God has blessed you in the past. You can look back through your life and you can see God's faithfulness in your life. You can also read through the scripture and remind yourself of the characteristics of who God is. He's not just anybody. He's absolutely amazing. And as we get to know him through the word of God and we begin to recognize and see who he is with his character, we end up reordering ourselves to say, this is a relationship that I want. And what happens inside of us is our heart begins to open up because God is a God who loves and cares about you. And one of the things that I like the most about praise is it puts you back in touch with the current of God in your life. God is taking you somewhere. He is taking you to be more like Jesus. He's taking you somewhere. He's taking you to better healing. He's taking you somewhere. He's taking you to a more integrated, healthy life. He is on the move taking you someplace. And when you praise God, you can remind yourself of how he is moving in your life. And you can expect that he will continue to do that. And so there are people that are here today that have joy in their heart that God is moving in really amazing ways. But I also know that there are people in a congregation our size who come in here today and they are wounded and they are carrying heavy burdens. It might be difficult for you to praise God in that way. It might have been hard to sing some songs this morning. It might be hard to actually focus. And we can still praise God in the midst of that situation. When I myself have had trouble with praising God because I've had my knees knocked out from underneath me or something really tragic has happened in my family or I get really rough news or I just read the headlines sometimes and my breath is taken away. And I just feel like, oh my gosh, what in the world is going to happen in our culture and in this time period in which we live? I'm reminded of Psalm 23 verse four, a very familiar passage of scripture that you could probably quote, but Psalm 23 four, is a psalm that David wrote about our good shepherd, who we know is Jesus. This is what he said. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which means in the Hebrew, deep darkness, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What is so amazing about this passage is that you indeed are on a path of life. And there are times that that path gets really dark and you don't know what tomorrow's gonna hold. You might not even know what the next hour is going to hold and everything has gone dark and you wonder where is God and what's really happening to me and what, what is my future going to be like? And Psalm 23 reminds you that you have a shepherd who is right with you on that path and we are to not be afraid, although at times we are and we are anxious because Jesus has protection and guidance. That's the rod and the staff that God himself is moving with you in your life to help you to move down the journey that you are actually on. And it's a little bit scary for us in that journey. I don't know about you, but I don't like to walk in the dark. But what is really cool is that in Psalm 139, verse 12, the psalmist writes that God sees in the dark, that what we cannot see is clear to him. Psalm 139, 12 says this, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, 
for darkness is as light to you. How can we praise God? Because he knows how to get around the boulders. He knows how to step over the pits. He knows how to move you through a situation as you lean on him and trust him and follow his ways and do what you know that you would really want to do as his disciple and he will help you through that particular situation because he is with you. He sees in the dark, he protects you, he comforts you and he guides you. He is your personal shepherd and he knows exactly what you need. Today, if you are on this path and you don't know what the future holds, he is with you to walk with you, to help you to be able to be the person that he has in mind for you to be. So whether you've come in today with a joyful heart or you've come in today with a dim path or a dark path, you can praise God for who he is and what he is doing in your life, which opens you up to what comes up next. Second letter that we're gonna be taking a look at in this acronym of pray is repent. And this is responding to the gospel every day. You and I never outgrow our need for a savior. And I wanna be particularly gentle at this part of the message because we tend to treat ourselves really harshly. I read uh, from a book once that we need to talk to ourselves like our best friend would speak to us instead of like our worst enemy. And in Christ, we can begin to talk to ourselves tenderly because repentance is a place that God calls us to, to lay down our burdens. It is a place where God says, I will take care of that. It is a place of freedom, not a place of shame. Repentance is a place where God separates you from your sins as far as the east is from the west. It's where your guilt and shame are absolved in his love and in the promise of forward motion in your life. I want you to think of repentance as a good thing, not as a bad thing. I don't want you to think of it as beating yourself up or having somebody else beat yourself up. I want you to think of it as a place of freedom. When you and I think about repentance, we often think about just feeling sorry, feeling bad or making an apology. But in the New Testament, repentance is, I'm going in a particular direction and I'm going to stop. And I'm going to say to God, I am going to change what I am doing because what I'm doing is not what you want me to do. What I am doing is harming me and what I am doing is sinful. I know it's wrong and I'm gonna turn to you. Repentance is turning back to God. It is your conscious choice to say, I want to have a different moment. And this is a moment of God's great kindness and a moment of gentleness for you. Hosea chapter 14 verses one through four actually gives us some steps of repentance. It's the only place in the Bible that I can find them. Here is what Hosea has said in verses one through four, chapter 14. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria cannot save us and we will not mount war horses. We will never say again our gods to what our hands have made for in you the fatherless find compassion. I will heal their waywardness and love them freely for my anger has turned away from them is what the Lord says in that last verse. Let's go back and construct this in a way that makes sense for us, pulling it into where we are today. The first thing that Hosea says is you need to admit what you've done. So let's just be really kind to ourselves here in just a minute and take a look at how we actually get off track. We can grow up in a family where we learn the wrong things and we think that they're the right things. We can move through our lives thinking that we're doing the right thing, even, even by the advice of other people, and then it just blows up and it's not the right thing to do. We can be truly ignorant and we just really don't know. We're just trying to do the best thing that we can. We can actually have somebody hurt us and then we respond in a really negative way because we don't know what else that we should be doing. We could actually have a hard heart and we could just say to God, I just don't care. What God is saying is, when you come to repent, you come to him and say, Lord, I've come for freedom. I've come to repent. I've come to lay down this burden that I am carrying and I'm going to turn away from it. I'm gonna take words, regardless of how I got here, I have done things. This is not about me feeling horrible for what I have done because I already feel bad enough as it is. This is me giving it to the Lord so he can separate it from me. And so I'm gonna to go to him with that. The second thing is I'm gonna be specific about what I've done. 
when you repent, you have to know what you're turning away from so that you can turn to God. If you're going to turn away from um, gossip, you need to turn to guarding people's reputation. If you're going to be turning away from anger, you need to be turning to being more peaceful. Whatever it is that you're going to be turning away from, you need to know what that is. And so you have to specifically do it rather than, Lord, I really had a bad day last night. And my wife and I, we really had a big fight, and I'm just really sorry about that, but I'm not going to talk to her about it. That doesn't work. That kind of response is not what the Bible talks about with repentance. Repentance is recognizing it and turning away from it. But what I love about this passage, which is really, truly amazing when I discovered it, was verse 3. Verse 3 is written to the nation of Israel, and it is about the national sins of Israel. And I want to use this as an analogy to your national sin. When we take a look at this passage, the national sin of Israel was political alliances, you know, hanging out with Assyria and Egypt, and idolatry, which created a whole bunch of problems. And God said, I will take care of that if you will repent. This was the source of most of their problems. Now, I want to be gentle here. I don't know what your national sin is. I don't know what keeps tripping you up over and over and over again. You know what it is. I know what mine is, you know what yours is. And what God says in Christ is, I will deal with that. I will help you to deal with that because I know how painful it is and I know how you get trapped in that. And I will not tire of helping you. You know, you and I get tired of ourselves and then we think God gets tired of us. God never gets tired of you. You are his child. Christ died for you. The Holy Spirit lives in your life and God brings you to the point of repentance as a good moment of reconciliation with him. Because he says in verse four that he will heal your waywardness, your slippery slope away from him. He wants to solve that and he's no longer gonna be mad at you. I've talked to lots of Christian people who wonder if God is really ticked at them. If you wonder if God is mad at you, this is the way that the scripture says you know he's not. You turn away from something over and over and over again, and this is the way that we can repent every day. Get in trouble? Repent like this. Turn away. Remember, we know what the truth is. This is the experience of repentance, but we may need help within the community in order to know what we need to do. We might need to get some help. And as we get that help, we're going to find that we're going to move closer and closer to Christ. God will help you and move you forward. But to keep you from thinking you have to do this on your own, Paul adds something beautiful through the power of the Holy Spirit because you can't deal with all of this on your own. He says in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 13, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body you will live. The Holy Spirit lives in you to give you the ability, the power to tell your story with people who love and trust you, to be able to turn away from sin in your private moments, to really begin to understand what the Word of God is saying in your life so that you can begin to move in the maturity that you are longing for. This idea of the misdeeds of the body in the Greek is, for all of you teachers, you'll understand this, the praxis of the flesh. It is the way you live your life when you don't live it with Jesus. Paul says we all have this tendency to live our lives a particular way outside of our relationship with Jesus, and we have to stop that. And we turn away from that, and we turn to Christ. Remember, in gentleness, we look at ourselves and go, yes, I need you. Yes, I'm going to embrace you. Yes, I need you to help me on my path. I want you to think of repentance as freedom. I want you to think of it as release. I want you to think of it as a good thing, that as you praise God and your heart softens toward him and you come to him and say, I just want you to know that I need to change this, God interacts with you in a way that is deeply meaningful. The third letter is ask, which is the approach the throne of grace. Now, this is called supplication. It's what most of us find to be pretty easy, is that we're going to ask God to help us or help people that we love. To ask simply means to urgently request something. So this is you coming to God now after you have acknowledged who he is, after you have repented and you have said, Lord, let's roll up our sleeves because I got a bunch of stuff I need to talk to you about. I feel good. 
being close to you. I know that you have separated my sin from me. I know that you are dealing with me. Now, let me talk about my family. Let me talk about my school. Let me talk about my colleagues. Let me talk about the world. Let's just spend some time dealing with what's going on. Jose, or Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 is the passage that I want to give to you about this. This is what the writer of Hebrews said about the urgency of asking and supplication. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Let's just stop and talk about two components of this passage that are amazing. Did you catch that it said Jesus was tempted in every way as you are and didn't sin? So let that sink into your soul for just a little bit. What would that have been like to have had a son, moms, let's just talk about this, had a boy, and he never did anything wrong? He was a preschooler, did everything without sinning. He was in elementary school, did everything without sinning. And then he had puberty and he did everything without sinning. And then he was a young man who wasn't married and he, he didn't abuse his power, he didn't do anything that was wrong. Well, let's just make Jesus a woman and let's just go through all the same thing, ladies, because he is also the one who guides you. He knows what it's like for you to have to deal with the temptations that you face. Now, the temptations are specifically different and they're tailored to us within our culture, but this verse is so meaningful because going back to the idea of the path and not knowing what to do, he knows exactly how to guide you with what you are facing. Isn't that amazing? That's what supplication is. God guide me, help me know what I need to do with how the world is affecting me, how my family is affecting me, what my national sins are, what I need help with, and you help me all the way through my life so that I can be a good reflection of you. The second thing about this verse that's so amazing is the idea of the throne. Now the throne is where God sits, right? I mean, I just want you to imagine in your holy imaginations this throne room of God, and God is there, and it's where all majesty and all might and all power and all authority rests. And God is separate from us in that sense, right? But notice what it says, is that Jesus will bring you with confidence to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace in your time of need. It's like all of that separates out and God himself looks to you and he says, daughter, tell me what you need. Son, what do you need? I am here for you and all of this ability in my heart moves to you because God's heart is open to you. And prayer is the way that you access it. You want God's heart to move toward you? This passage tells you, march into the throne room of grace, recognizing that in your own relationship with Christ, he will help you. But let's just say that you don't have any words. You've ever been there? Where you wanna go into the throne room of grace and you wanna say something, but the words just don't come. Either you can't formulate them because you can't find the right way to say something, or you yourself are so discombobulated that you don't even know um, what you're thinking and feeling at the time. Well, the Holy Spirit is your advocate in this sense. Romans chapter 8, 26 through 27 says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. You don't need words. All you have to do is sit there. I don't know about you, school shootings get me. I will sit in my chair and I'll say, Lord, I have no words. I have no words. All I have is a broken heart. The war in Ukraine, it gets me. I have no words. All I have is a broken heart. I can find words, but in those moments, I want to access this, the guttural Wonderful connection with God in emotion. Read my heart. Move forward in a particular way because I can express the emotions of agony. I can express my heartfelt desire that something was better and you can read it. And you can take that before the throne and you, you know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with it. Well, let's add the fourth component, the letter Y, which stands for yield. And this is to let the Holy Spirit lead you. You can't live the Christian life on your own and you can't will yourself into better behavior. 
you can yield yourself under the leadership of the Holy Spirit to change you. Because at some point, we all run out of energy. And what we want to do is let the Holy Spirit come into our lives and as part of the mystery of our faith, grow us to move us forward. Paul talks about this mystery in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Remember, we've turned away from that to turn to God. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you don't do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. But the acts of the flesh are obvious. This is what we have turned away from. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, etc. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you don't want God in your life, you don't want God to be a part of you and you don't want to turn from things, what Paul is saying here is that you will not have the benefits that we're talking about. Then he goes on in verse 22 and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, fancy word for patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So let me talk to all of you reformed legalists in here, like myself. We hear a sermon like this and we think, I got all this stuff I got to do, right? No, 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 no. This is not something I do to get a result. This is a relationship with the living God who has said, if you will move in these ways, in a relationship with me, and submit yourself to the leading of the Holy Spirit, you will have the fruit of the Spirit. I do have a role to play. P-R-A is my role to play. Why? My role is to yield so that the Holy Spirit can come in where I say, Lord, it's up to you, man. I, I'm going to do the best I can. I don't know how this all works, but you have to help me to move forward. And I will do what it takes. I will learn in the scripture. I will learn about prayer. I will stay in a community. I will do what I can do because you are the Lord of my life and you know my path and you know what I need to repent from and you know what I need to ask for and you know how you can lead me so that I can have the kind of life that you long for me to have. Through praise, repentance, asking, and yielding, God intends to change you. I don't know where you are today, but God intends to change you, to keep making you more and more like Jesus. And it is my desire, it is our hope as a church, that you will put into practice, P-R-A-Y, experience the goodness of God. Let's ask for his blessing on that. Lord, let us move toward you through praise, through repentance, through asking what we need and yielding our lives to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Do your work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that the best way for us to respond this morning to a message that is practical, that is pastoral, that really is more so about the character of who our God is, that he is a God who desires to be with his people, to have relationship with us, is to spend time in prayer, to really sit with this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through what Peter just, just said, praise, um, we're gonna repent, we're gonna, going to ask and we're going to yield to him. So let's go ahead and start. Maybe you wanna take a posture of prayer with your hands out or maybe you wanna uh, pray with your spouse or with your family. I invite you to take that posture now um, and we'll start with praising God. Tell God how amazing he is. Focus on what is excellent about our God.
don't spend time in repentance. Tell God what you're turning away from and what you're turning to and be reminded that he is a God that is gentle and lowly towards you. I'll spend time asking God. Maybe you have needs or maybe you know of needs that those around you have. Spend time asking, knowing that he is a God who provides. Now let's spend time yielding, re-surrendering over to God, knowing that he has placed his Holy Spirit inside of us to lead and to guide and to comfort us. May we surrender to him. you stand as we continue to have a posture of prayer as we sing together that his kingdom come and his will be done.
your heart, all who suffer and mourn. The Lord is at hand, and His kingdom is yours. Lift up your eyes, all who church this morning as we close together I just want to read this benediction over us that we've read over the past couple of weeks from Ephesians this is what it says for this reason I kneel before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Church, you are dismissed.